This is a story about a warplane so advanced it could dive at 400 miles per hour, unleash a hailstorm of rockets, and still outmaneuver most fighters. It's also a story of how that same plane kept disintegrating mid-flight, not from enemy fire, but its own guns. Welcome to Historical Digs. For today, we uncover the chaos behind the Bristol Brigand, a promising plane with a lethal design flaw deep in its core. The Post-War Promise – Ambition versus Reality In the smoldering aftermath of World War II, Britain's Royal Air Force stood at a crossroads. The empire it had once policed from the skies was fracturing, colonies clamored for independence, defense budgets evaporated, and the specter of obsolescence loomed over its aging fleet of mosquitoes and bowfighters. The RAF needed a new workhorse, a versatile jet-age strike aircraft that could bomb rebel hideouts in Malaya, patrol the North Sea for Soviet submarines, and project power across a shrinking globe. Enter the Bristol Brigand, a plane born not from innovation but from improvisation. The Brigand's origins trace back to 1943, when Bristol Aeroplane Company began designing the Buckingham, a fast medium bomber intended to replace the RAF's wartime stalwarts. But by 1944, the Buckingham was already obsolete. Jet engines like the Gloucester Meteor's Derwent promised revolutionary futures, while Allied bombing campaigns proved that speed alone couldn't evade flak or fighters. The Air Ministry cancelled the Buckingham, only to resurrect its airframe months later for a new role. Desperate to avoid wasting years on fresh designs, officials tasked Bristol with converting the bomber into a multi-role strike aircraft. Bristol's engineers faced an impossible mandate – adapt a high-altitude bomber for low-level ground attacks, torpedo runs, and rocket strikes. The Bristol Centaurus 57 radial engines, 18-cylinder behemoths, generating 24 horsepower each, were retained, giving the Brigand a top speed of 350 miles per hour, faster than many fighters. Its wings, designed to carry 4,000 pounds of bombs at 30,000 feet, were now expected to withstand the stresses of dive bombing and napalm strikes. Engineers added reinforced spars and dive brakes, but these were band-aids on a blueprint never meant for brutality. Before we dig deeper into the Bristol Brigand story, hit that like button and subscribe to Historical Digs. Your support helps us unearth the lost stories of history's most ingenious war machines. The political climate compounded the chaos. Churchill's 1945 defeat ushered in a Labour government whose austerity agenda gutted Britain's military budget. The RAF couldn't afford to develop new aircraft, so it repurposed old ones. Bristol, eager to retain its air ministry contracts, downplayed the Brigand's compromises. Brochures touted its unmatched versatility, glossing over a fatal truth – the plane had no clear mission. Was it a torpedo bomber, a rocket-equipped tank buster, or a long-range patrol craft? The air ministry wanted all three, but as flight logs from the aeroplane and armament experimental establishment reveal, the Brigand excelled at none. Trials began in late 1946 and cracks emerged, literally. During high-speed dives, the wings visibly flexed, alarming crews who'd flown sturdier wartime planes. Ground crews at RAF Boscombe Down reported stress fractures around the engine mounts after just 50 flight hours. Yet the Air Ministry, pressured to modernize, ignored red flags. Internal assessments from 1947 acknowledged the Brigand's marginal airworthiness, but RAF leadership pressed ahead, arguing that operational necessity outweighed growing technical concerns. Production orders were assigned. The Brigand's fatal flaw wasn't its wings or engines, it was timing. By 1948, the RAF's needs had shifted again. Jet fighters like the de Havilland Vampire dominated rearmament budgets, while Britain's nuclear program siphoned funds from conventional weapons. The Brigand, a piston-powered relic in a jet-powered world, became an anachronism before its first squadron even formed. Its original targets – Axis warships and bunkers – no longer existed, leaving it to hunt insurgents in jungles it couldn't navigate. Yet the RAF pressed on, deploying brigands to arid bases in Aden and humid airstrips in Singapore. Mechanics soon discovered that the plane's Rolls-Royce hydromatic propellers, optimized for European climates, faltered in tropical heat. Sand clogged air intakes, humidity warped the wooden components in its control systems. The brigand, designed in Britain's damp chill, was melting under the sun it was meant to patrol. 
In hindsight, the brigand was a product of institutional denial, a refusal to admit that Britain's era of propeller-driven omnipotence had ended. Its story begins not with a blueprint, but with a paradox. The harder engineers tried to future-proof it, the more it became a museum piece. By the time the first brigand squadron formed in 1949, the future had already left it behind. Blueprint for Disaster the Bristol Brigand specifications promised a predator. Four 20mm Hispano cannons capable of shredding armored vehicles, eight RP-3 rockets, each packing a 60-pound warhead, and a bomb load rivaling medium World War II bombers. But beneath this arsenal lay a chilling truth. The Brigand's greatest enemy wasn't on the ground. It was engineered into its bones. The cannons mounted in the wings were the first betrayal. To save weight, Bristol anchored the Hispano guns directly to the wing spar, a design choice borrowed from lighter fighter planes. But fighters fired in short bursts. The brigand's ground attack role demanded sustained barrages. During a 1947 gunnery trial at RAF Pembry, a test pilot unleashed a 10-second burst, standard for strafing runs. The recoil from the cannons, equivalent to a sledgehammer striking the wing 600 times per minute, cracked the spar attachments. Witnesses reported the starboard wingtip visibly drooping before the pilot aborted. Engineers later discovered microfractures radiating from every gun mount, a spiderweb of impending failure. The vibration frequency matched the wing's natural resonance, a death sentence written in physics. Bristol's solution? Bolt thicker steel plates to the wings, but added weight strained the Centaurus engines, already guzzling fuel at 180 gallons per hour. Mechanics at RAF Habania reportedly likened the brigand to a drunk weightlifter, over-muscled and unsteady. Meanwhile, the brakes were staging their own mutiny. The brigand's predecessor, the Buckingham, used hydraulic disc brakes, reliable but heavy. To shave 300 pounds, Bristol reverted to World War II-era drum brakes, a technology the RAF had abandoned for jets. During landing trials at Aden Scorching Air Base in 1948, brake temperatures soared to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, welding the shoes to the drums. Pilots had two choices, skid off the runway or watch their landing gear ignite. A harrowing incident at RAF Ein Schemmer saw a brigand careen into a fuel truck. Its brakes literally fused into immobility. The crash report concluded the undercarriage's design failed catastrophically under extreme heat. Then came the rockets. The RP-3, a proven weapon on typhoons and mosquitoes, became a liability on the brigand. Mounted on rails beneath the wings, the rockets relied on electrical ignition, a system vulnerable to the brigand's own engine vibrations. During a 1949 sortie over Malaya, a pilot fired two rockets. One launched normally, the other shuddered, then spun backward into the fuselage. The explosion sheared off the tail, leaving the crew no time to eject. Investigators traced the faults of frayed wiring on 40% of the fleet, a defect overlooked in Bristol's rush to meet delivery quotas. Adding to the chaos, the brigand's hydraulics were an overly complex nightmare. To save space, engineers routed hydraulic lines alongside electrical cables near the engine block. Heat from the Centaurus motors, which could hit 480 degrees Fahrenheit, caused the lines to swell and leak. A flaw discovered only after multiple aircraft lost rudder control mid-flight. Repairs required dismantling half the airframe, a 12-hour ordeal that ground crews dubbed Bristol's Revenge. Yet the most insidious flaw was invisible the brigand's center of gravity. Designed as a bomber, its original weight distribution assumed heavy payloads in the bomb bay, but as a strike aircraft, it often carried rockets and fuel tanks under the wings instead. This shifted the center of gravity, making the plane tail heavy during evasive maneuvers. During a 1951 training flight, a pilot attempting a steep bank found the controls unresponsive. According to one training report, the brigand flipped onto its back and plunged into the Bristol Channel, a tragedy attributed to aerodynamic instability exacerbated by improper loading. The brigand's designers had committed aviation's cardinal sin. They built a machine that punished competence. Skilled pilots trained to push limits were most at risk. The harder you flew it, the likelier it was to break. By 1950, RAF squadrons developed a grim checklist, inspect wings for cracks, test brakes before taxiing, pray the rockets fire forward. But the brigand was stubborn, and eventually it didn't just fail, it betrayed them. When the brigand fought itself. 
The Bristol Brigand didn't merely malfunction, it waged war on its own crew. Every system, from weapons to life support, seemed to harbor a grudge. Take the RP-3 rockets, battle-tested on Hawker Typhoons, they destroyed tanks and bunkers across Europe. But mounted on the Brigand, they became rogue agents. During a 1949 training exercise off the Welsh coast, a pilot fired a salvo at a target raft. Two rockets straight true. The third jammed, then detonated inside its launch rail, blasting a three-foot hole in the wing. Debris shredded the ailerons, forcing the crew to ditch in the Irish Sea. The official inquiry blamed excessive vibration from the Centaurus engines which shook rocket mounts loose, a flaw absent in slower, sturdier aircraft like the Typhoon. Then there was the oxygen system, a ticking chemical time bomb. To save weight, Bristol adapted a bomber-style setup. High-pressure oxygen tanks routed through uninsulated rubber hoses. During a 1950 high-altitude test, friction from the hoses generated enough heat to ignite the pure oxygen inside. The resulting explosion tore through the cockpit, severing control cables. The pilot, surviving the emergency landing, described the cockpit reeking of scorched metal and melted insulation. Subsequent inspections found scorch marks in 12 other brigands, prompting a fleet-wide grounding, one of seven such orders in the aircraft's short career. Even fair weather couldn't save it. The brigand's heating system, scavenged from the Buckingham's high-altitude bomber configuration, leaked carbon monoxide into the cockpit during low-level sorties. At 500 feet, pilots need warmth, not poison. Navigators resorted to handheld gas detectors, but delayed warnings often proved futile. A 1951 mission over Sudan ended with both crewmen unconscious, the brigand plowing into a sand dune at 300 miles per hour. The accident report noted a CO concentration of 1,200 parts per million, enough to kill within minutes. Bristol's fix? A typed placard advising crews to open cockpit vents periodically. Armorers developed their own survival rituals. Loading the 20mm cannons required inserting each shell manually, a 45-minute ordeal because the brigand's vibration-prone wings misaligned the feed mechanisms. Ground crews in Cyprus reportedly joked about shells jamming so frequently they greased the ammunition with mutton fat to appease the gremlins. It worked until a misfired round kicked off in the breach, blowing the cannon's barrel clean off. By 1952, RAF safety logs documented over 100 brigand incidents between 1949 and 1951, with a majority attributed to mechanical failures rather than enemy action. Aviation historians estimate that non-combat issues accounted for over half of these losses. The brigand's reputation for unreliability became so pervasive that crews regarded it less as a weapon and more as a liability. Gamble in the Hangars by 1950, the RAF faced a grim calculus – retire the brigand and admit defeat, or keep flying it and risk mutiny. With no viable replacement and colonial rebellions flaring from Malaya to Kenya, the choice was made by default. Squadrons became improvisational theaters, where mechanics welded hope to hollow airframes and pilots flew with crossed fingers. The brigand's deployment to Malaya in 1949 laid bare the farce. Tasked with bombing communist insurgents, it struggled in monsoon rains that swelled its wooden controlled surfaces, warping ailerons into useless twists. Ground crews resorted to blowtorches to dry them, a process that once ignited a wing's fabric coating. Supply shortages turned desperation into ingenuity. With no spare parts, mechanics stripped wrecks for components. One brigand at RAF Habania reportedly flew with a tail section from a scrap Buckingham, a mismatched hybrid with terrible handling. Hydraulic fluid was filtered through silk stockings. Cannon springs were hand-forged from telephone cables. Even the manuals were outdated, forcing crews to pencil in corrections. A 1951 inventory noted 37% of technical guides had amended procedures not approved by Bristol. Commanders pressured to show progress turned a blind eye. Sortie quotas were met by counting aborted missions as training flights. A 1952 memo argued the brigand's presence alone deterred insurgents despite its operational failings. Tell that to the crew whose landing gear collapsed after a raid, not from damage but metal fatigue in a strut salvaged from a different plane. Morale curdled into gallows humor. Betting pools wagered on which system would fail next. A game halted only after a navigator lost six months' pay on an oxygen line explosion. 
the RAF's gamble wasn't just tactical, it was existential. To ground the brigand would mean conceding that Britain's post-war might was a mirage. So they kept flying, not because they believed in the machine, but because admitting failure was a luxury empires on life support couldn't afford. A Tainted Legacy The Bristol Brigand's retirement in 1955 was less an endpoint than an admission. Its successors, like the English Electric Canberra, didn't merely replace it, they repudiated its very philosophy. Where the Brigand had prioritized firepower over survivability, the Canberra embraced jet engines, pressurized cabins, and redundant systems. Engineers, chastened by the Brigand's litany of failures, enshrined a new mantra – durability precedes versatility. The RAF's post-war doctrine shifted irreversibly, trading brute force for reliability, a lesson etched in aluminum and blood. No intact Brigand survived today. The fuselage of Brigand RH-746 was recovered from a scrapyard in 1981 and later entered the collection of the Royal Air Force Museum Cosford in 2010. Additionally, remnants of Brigand RH-755, which belonged to 45 Squadron, still lie at the crash site in Malaysia, where the aircraft was lost in January 1951. Aviation historians often regarded the Brigand as a hinge between eras. Its many design flaws underscored the urgent need for improved aeronautical safety, reinforcing the move toward isolated oxygen systems, better vibration damping, and other fail-safes that became standard in the jet age. Even its ignominious role as a stopgap influenced Cold War procurement, with planners prioritizing incremental upgrades over rushed redesigns. A 1957 Royal Aircraft Establishment report concluded that the Brigand's flaws provided critical lessons for future designs. Yet the Brigand's truest legacy lies in its absence. No memorials honor its crews, no squadrons bear its name. It exists today as a cautionary exhibit, a machine whose only victory was proving how not to build an aircraft. In the end, the Brigand's greatest service was grounding itself so others could fly. Was the Bristol Brigand a victim of bad timing or a cautionary tale of engineering hubris? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this deep dig into aviation's awkward phase, hit subscribe and ring the bell for more tales of tech gone sideways. History isn't just about the winners, it's about the wrecks that paved their way.